Okay, so the first thing I want to do, um, and this will be about uh, 30 minutes or so, is I want to talk about, in general, computer architecture simulation. Um, so I want to give a little bit of uh, history on Gem 5, a little bit of perspective, my perspective on computer architecture simulation to help contextualize what we'll be learning this week, and then we'll talk a little bit about Gem 5 software architecture at the end to get some nomenclature and words that we'll be using um, throughout the week. Okay, so Gem 5 history. So first, there was M5. So M5 was a simulator created at University of Michigan uh, by Steve Reinhardt um, and his students, uh, principally um, the late Nate Binkert, who um, did an amazing job putting together just a beautiful software architecture that has been um, around now for 20 years, more than 20 years, and is still going strong. So they called M5 a tool for simulating systems. So I really like looking at this slide. So this was um, back in 2005. Um, Steve and uh, Nate and the others at Michigan did a tutorial at ISCA on M5. And this was one of the slides they used. Um, and they described M5 as a framework for event-driven simulation with events, objects, statistics, and configuration, and a set or a collection of predefined object models, CPUs, caches, buses, devices. And if you look at Gem5 today, this still perfectly describes what Gem5 is. So I think it's a real testament to the um, vision that they had back around the year 2000 that we're still using this tool basically in the same state as it was uh, them. I mean, lots of improvements, but the vision is still the same. So around the same time, uh, there was a project called Multifaceted Gems um, at Wisconsin. So this was uh, students of Mark Hill and David Wood. Um, and GEMS really focused on a detailed memory system. So interestingly, they also had a tutorial at the same ISCA in 2005 about GEMS. And GEMS at the 5,000 feet level was this thing, this GEM called Ruby, which was a memory system, and then a few other things. And you know, also, for better or for worse, GEMS hasn't changed that much since then as well. Um, we still have Ruby, and we're still using uh, Ruby today. So now we have these two simulators, M5 and GEMS, um, and they were combined together in 2011 to make GEM5. Um, so we took most of the simulation infrastructure from M5, combined it with the uh, Ruby memory system from GEMS, and we got uh, GEM5. So what is GEM5? GEM5 is M5 plus GEMS. And as described um, by somebody, uh, GEM5 is a simulator uh, which is a modular platform for computer system architecture research encompassing system level architecture as well as process or microarchitecture. So these are the two canonical um, citations for GEM5. So at the bottom was the original GEM5 paper um, published in Computer Architecture News, and then above it is um, the paper published a a few years ago, Gem 520, which was kind of a follow-on uh, to the Gem 5 paper. Any questions so far? Okay. So Gem 520, um, this was, uh, you know, we have lots and lots of contributors to Gem 5, and something that was really important to me as I started taking over the leadership of the project is that everybody was recognized. And so the Gem 520 paper has like seven, more than 70 authors. So this is a list of all the authors on the Gem 520 paper. And you know, it's coming up on about five years since that paper, so I imagine we're gonna be publishing a new one soon, and your name could be here. You know, we want to grow the community, we want everybody to be part of this. So Gem 5's goals, as stated by you know, Nate and Steve back when they were doing M5, is to be a computer system simulator. So a lot of computer architecture simulation really focuses on the ISA and the microarchitecture. They focus on new instructions to do, how the microarchitecture um, executes. But the domain of computer system research is this entire stack from the application all the way down to the devices. So the goal of Gem5 is to be able to do, the, to enable you to do this kind of research. To be able to do research that touches all these layers of the stack. So another goal 
is, um, you know, Hennessy and Patterson gave the Turing lecture whew, seven years ago now, longer than I care to admit. Um, and one of the things that they talked about was this agile hardware development methodology. We want to make hardware development more like software development. And one of the important keys to this is this tightest, quickest flow at the bottom for you to do design space exploration, for you to see if this new idea for a new hardware might work and it might be worth, worth it to take it to an FPGA or actually go to an ASIC. And so Gem 5's focus is on this C++ level in between where you do the tightest, quickest iteration in the agile hardware methodology. So our goal as a community is for anyone I imagine most people in the audience are computer architecture researchers, but we really want anybody, even um, non-architects, to be able to download and use Gem5 to do hardware software co-design research. We want it to be used for this really cross-stack research. So we want to be able to do things like change the kernel, change the runtime, change the um, hardware, all in concert. And this is the goal of Gem5, is to enable this. We want to be able to run full ML stacks on Gem5, do AR, VR stacks, and whatever the new emerging application is next, we want to be able to use Gem5 to do this. And today, when you download and use Gem5, it's pretty close. We can do a lot of this. There's a lot of rough edges on Gem5, and that's one of the things, you know, at the end with the contributing, is I want to encourage you all to contribute back and smooth out some of these rough edges. Um, and you can help make Gem5 um, even better in the future. So a brief thing about the Gem5 community. So Gem5 has hundreds of contributors. Um, I think the most recent release, we had like 80-something unique contributors in six months. So over about a year, we have nearly 100 unique contributors. And we don't do a very good job of keeping track of how many users there are, but I would estimate easily well over 1,000 users. Um, and we aim, Gem5 aims to meet a lot of different needs. So we aim to meet the needs of academic research, which I think is most of you here. Um, aim to meet the needs of industry research, so companies such as um, Google and AMD and ARM and Samsung and Micron, um, Rambus, and many others use Gem5 internally to do uh, their research and development. And then we also aim uh, for classroom use. So if you're taking a computer architecture course at your university, they might be using Gem5, or we at least want to enable that. We have a code of conduct, um, which is in our uh, repository, um, which at a high level is be respectful of everybody. Um, and in general, we really want to see the community grow. Again, this is why we're putting on things like this boot camp, is so we can grow the community um, around Gem5. OK, so before I move on uh, to my views on simulation. Any questions about uh, Gem5 history, Gem5 community, those kinds of things? Uh, Monday morning, not a very talkative bunch. OK, so let's talk a little bit about uh, computer system simulation. So I really like um, the way, so, so leave an eek out a uh, professor at um, University of Ghent in Belgium, um, he wrote a book uh, or a computer synthesis lecture on uh, computer architecture performance evaluation methods. And I really like the way that he put this. So scientific research is about developing a hypothesis, coming up with an experiment to test the hypothesis, run the experiment, analyzing the data, and then going back and revising your hypothesis. Systems research is not all that different. Again, we have a hypothesis about how something that we change about the system, how it's going to affect things. We want to design an experiment, which might include picking a baseline and workloads to run with. And then we develop a model and run that model. And so Gem5 is really focused on developing and running um, this model to measure the effect of our idea um, on the hardware. And of course, we do this iteratively. And so, I mean, I, I think it really comes down to this thing of like, we need some kind of tool to evaluate our systems that don't exist before we build the system. We need to be able to estimate performance, power, energy, these kinds of things. And this is what we use simulation for, even whether it's RTL simulation or C++ level simulation like Gen 5. It's really costly to make hardware. So we want to be pretty confident that what we're making is good. Um, and, and computer systems are incredibly complex today. 
And so we need something. We can't just design an RTL for some accelerator and expect that that's going to fit into the system and be good. We need to see, you know, like an Amdahl's law kind of thing of where some, like, where that accelerator is going to fit into the larger application. And then we can do design space exploration and simulation, which is much more difficult to do in RTL or in hardware. We can look to see, well, if we sweep cache sizes from one kilobyte to a megabyte, what's the effect? Whereas if you had to design the SRAM cells to do that, it would take, I don't know, months, if not years. So simulation is uh, very useful. Unsurprising to hear me say that. But there are alternatives to simulation. Um, simulation is not always the right tool for the job. And I tell my students, you know, whenever they have a new idea for something, we ask, is Gym 5 the right tool, or is there something out there that's better? Um, and so you'll, you'll never hear me Gym 5 is the only hammer to hit all the nails with. So some alternatives include things like um, uh, analytic models. So Omdahl's law is important, or queuing theory um, can also be, also be used. Um, okay, so I want to talk for a minute about different kinds of simulation. This also comes from uh, Levin's book. So um, there's functional simulation. So functional simulation, a, 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 and I guess before I go through all these, you'll notice that we, we will use this language throughout the boot camp to describe different ways that Gym 5 works as well. So in functional simulation, it executes programs correctly, but usually doesn't give you any timing information. So you can use this to validate the correctness of compilers, validate your runtime. When you're bringing up a new ISA or something, it's really useful. And some examples include uh, Spike, QEMU, and Gem 5's atomic mode. So then there's instrumentation-based um, simulators. So this is often binary translation, although it doesn't have to be. Um, Usually, when these instrumentation-based simulators, they run on real hardware and then have callbacks. So it's kind of like trace-based, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and it's not very flexible to new ISAs or new instructions, and a lot of things are opaque. So examples of this are Intel's PIN, NVIDIA's NVBit, um, and, some, and the simulators that are built on top of that. So things like Champ Sim or Sniper um, are instrumentation-based uh, simulators. ZSIM is another example. And then there's trace-based simulators. So trace-based simulators generate a trace of addresses or events and then re-execute uh, that trace. Trace-based simulators can be very fast. You don't have to do the functional simulation every time. And you can reuse those traces after you create them the first time. However, one of the big downsides of trace-based simulation is if the execution of the program depends on the timing, then your trace is invalidated whenever the timing changes. So a good example of this is if you're doing multi-threading. The way that the amount of time that the threads take will change the thread interleaving, which actually changes the execution. So it's very difficult to get accurate results out of trace-based simulation for multi-threaded applications or applications that access the operating system or do I.O. Um, trace-based simulators are often specialized simulators for a single aspect of the system. So for instance, you could get cache hits misses out of it or branch predictor accuracy, but it's difficult to get performance. So then we have execution-driven uh, simulation. Uh, so execution-driven simulation is when functional simulation and timing simulation is combined. So we call this in Gem 5 execute and execute. So in other words, you don't do the add to add two registers together until you're actually in the execute stage of the processor. So Gem 5 is like this, and so are many other uh, simulators as well. And then there's full system, which is a little bit orthogonal uh, to these other things. And in full system simulation, you're modeling all the components of the system with enough fidelity to run mostly unmodified applications. So you're often doing bare metal simulation uh, with full system. So um, everything about the program is being emulated by the simulator. So this often means running the full operating system, running you know, maybe even the low-level bootloader on which the Linux kernel runs, and then your application on top of that. Uh, full system simulators often have um, I.O. as well. And so you usually see full system combined with functional or execution-based. 
So like QEMU is a full system emulator. Gem5 is a full system simulator. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit of, uh, more nomenclature. Again, I apologize for this coming um, early on a Monday morning. Um, so I like to talk about Gem5 and the way Gem5 interacts with the system using the same language as virtual machines. I think a lot of us are familiar with virtual machines and uh, virtualization. So in virtualization, you have a host, which is uh, the bottom red hardware, and you can run things natively on that host. So we call that native execution. Um, when you virtualize your system, you can have a hypervisor layer here um, where you have a guest operating system running on uh, the hypervisor, which is running on the host. Um, so the operating system in the virtual machine is called a guest operating system, and the hypervisor emulates the hardware for multiple different operating systems. Okay? So now if we look at what Gem5 does, Gem5 very much acts like this hypervisor. So again, we have a host, which is the actual hardware we're running on. So if I'm running Gem5 on my laptop, then my laptop would be the host. We have the simulator, which runs on the host and exposes hardware to the guest. The guest is the code that is running on the simulated hardware. So the operating system running inside Gem5 would be the guest operating system. And Gem5 is simulating the hardware for this operating system. So one thing that is often uh, confusing and difficult to talk about precisely, but we have both the simulator code, which is the code that's running on the host, and then the guest code that's running on Gem5, not on the host. So your benchmark or your workload would be the thing that's running on Gem5, and then Gem5 is running on the host. So we'll be talking both about the simulated code, the guest code, as well as the simulator code as well. Um, and so, you know, one of the important things here is we'll be talking both about the simulator's performance, so how long it takes to run something in Gem5, as well as the simulated performance, which is what we really want to know. We want to know the performance of our application on some new hardware. Um, so we'll be talking about both of these things. Any questions on this nomenclature? We will try to be precise in our language. It's difficult. So if you're confused or you have a question, raise your hand and we will try to um, make it more clear. Okay. So I um, kind of want to end here, or getting towards the end, um, talking about trade-offs and different kinds of simulation. So we have a bunch of trade-offs when we're developing simulators. So we have a trade-off between the amount of time it takes to develop the simulator. So as was mentioned earlier, RTL, for instance, takes a long time to develop. There's the amount of time it actually takes to evaluate how long it takes to run the simulator, the accuracy of the simulator, and then the coverage of the simulator. So accuracy would be how precise that simulator is giving you results for what you're trying to simulate. And uh, the coverage would be all the different kinds of things uh, simulators can do. So things like um, specialized cache and prediction simulation are pretty fast to develop, pretty fast to run, but don't give you very good coverage. Whereas full system execution-driven simulation, which is what we'll be focused on a lot um, through this week, is highly accurate, has really great coverage, but as those of you who have used Gem5 know, the development time is not great. Still better than RTL, but not great. So I often get asked um, at you know, Gem5 tutorials um, or um, by students, what level should we be simulating? And I think it's a really good question. It's something that like whatever research project you have is one of the first questions you should be asking. Well, what is it, what's my research question that I'm trying to ask, and then what is the right level to simulate? You know, so we should try to decide what's the right fidelity for the research question that I have. So for instance, if your idea is to develop a new register file design, I would argue the right fidelity is probably RTL, or maybe even lower, because What's really important in a new register file design is going to be the area and the power. And these are things that Gem5 can estimate, but it's not going to give you very precise numbers for. 
And then in the end, it ends up often being a mix of different fidelities. So you want some parts of the system that's very, very high fidelity, very um, precise, complex model. In other parts of the system, maybe you care less about, and you can run at a lower fidelity. And this is one of the places that Gem5 really shines, is that it's modular, so you can plug in different models at different places, and these models can be different fidelities. And oftentimes, these models um, are drop-in replacements for one another. So I also want to address this cycle level versus cycle accurate thing. Um, so RTL simulation, um, so RTL, for those of you um, who might not be familiar, is a register transfer logic. So this is when you specify every single register in your system, and then the wires that are connecting these registers together, and the gates between them, essentially. So you specify everything, and you end up with something that's pretty close to what your actual ASIC is going to be if you go through tape out um, and manufacturing. I would call RTL simulation cycle accurate. You should get cycle by cycle the exact same uh, results in your RTL simulation as you do um, from the ASIC that you get back. Okay, maybe not exactly the same, but it should be close. So this is very high fidelity, but it comes at a huge cost of configurability. Um, you need to do the entire design from beginning to end. You can't skip anything. And it's really difficult to combine functional and timing um, in these things. So I would call RTL simulation um, cycle accurate. Gem 5, I would call cycle level simulation. So Gem 5 simulates things cycle by cycle. You can simulate every single cycle of the system. You can simulate sub-cycle if you wanted to. Um, and these cycle level simulators are often event-driven. So they're not driven by clocks, but driven by events, which we'll see um, in the next section. They can be highly accurate, but not necessarily cycle by cycle accurate of an ASIC. In fact, almost always not. Um, and the other thing about cycle level is they can be easily parameterized. So you can change the number of cycles things take um, pretty easy. And cycle level simulation can be much faster than cycle accurate. You're allowed to cheat if you don't have to design every single component. Um, in the system. So those of you who have submitted papers to um, computer architecture venues, if you got a comment back on your paper saying, don't use cycle accurate, use cycle level when you were using Gem 5, that was probably me. I give that comment a lot. So I want to briefly go over uh, Gem 5's um, software architecture. Um, so Gem5 is made up of a bunch of C++ and Python code. So it's kind of a combination of C++ and Python. So on the C++ side, we have um, models or sim objects. And Gem5 has hundreds of these models. So these are models of caches, models of cores, models of NICs, models for anything in the system. And we have hundreds of different models, um, models of DRAM. And these models come with lots of parameters. So caches might have sizes, associativities, the number of MSHRs, all, um, all sorts of things. Cores have the number of stages, the number of entries in the reorder buffer, the physical registers, these kinds of things. So these models are highly parameterized. So then, since these are so complex and so highly parameterized, um, and this is one of the key things from M5, we have Python wrappers around all of these sim objects, or our models. So you write Python code to create your system. So um, in particular, component, what we call components, um, have some model with some set of parameters on it. So for instance, you might have a processor which has multiple i7 cores, and those i7 cores you know, have some particular size of their load store queue some particular number of Rob entries. And this you'll find in the standard library. Um, so these are all in Python, exposed in the standard library. And then you write your own Python code to control the simulation. So you decide what um, standard library modules or components you want to use, how they fit together, and then you write Python code to control the simulation. So you might start the simulation, dump the statistics, stop the simulation at some instruction. 
Whatever experiment it is that you want to do, you'll write Python code to do this. So one of the things that I've harped on a lot, and I think that I need to probably not harp on it as much now as I used to, now that we have the standard library, but the interface to Gem5 is Python, not the command line. And we'll see that throughout the week. So um, one of the things, the main component of Gem5 is something called a sim object. So these are all the models that you'll find um, in C++. So if you're in the Gem5 source directory, or the Gem5 code, in the source directory is where you find all of the sim objects. These sim objects have parameters that you can specify, and these parameters that you can specify will be found also in the source directory in the sim object declaration file. So right now I'm just giving you a big high-level overview. We'll go into lots more detail about this um, on Wednesday, I think. So then, uh, so we have these models that have a bunch of parameters, and then we're going to create an instance or a configuration of these models. So that would be a particular choice of values for these parameters. Um, so this could be in the standard library, in your extension to the standard library, or in your Python run script where you do this. So again, I want to emphasize this difference between the model versus the parameter. So the model is the C++ code that does timing simulation, so generic timing simulation. So over here is like a picture of um, some core. I don't know what core that is. I got it off the internet. I forget. Um, so this is the design of a core. And you, you know, we have a front end and a back end and some caches. And you can imagine exposing parameters in this model. You could expose parameters like the width of the instruction queue to the rename buffer or the type of branch predictor that you use, or a parameter might be the size of the cache. And so to create this exact thing, you would need to specify all these parameters, but the model is just the generic implementation that has a front end, a scheduler, a bunch of execution units. That's what the model is. So uh, as I was just mentioning, um, so you can add new models to Gem5. You can also take existing model interfaces, such as the base CPU, and extend that to model something different. So in Gem5, we have an out-of-order CPU, uh, which is a base CPU. We also have an in-order CPU, which is a base CPU. So you can take that base CPU interface and extend it to model other, uh, other things. So that's extending a model, and this would be um, changing the C++ code. Or you can specialize a model with some set of parameters. So for instance, if you wanted to make the i7 CPU, maybe this was an i7. If you look at it, I think it has 10 different ports between the scheduler and the execution units. And so we can spe specify that the issue width of this i7 CPU is 10, based on the out-of-order CPU that's in Gem5. So there's this distinction between extending the model to model new things versus taking a model that's there and specifying the parameters for it. In both cases, we're going to be using um, object-oriented design uh, to do it. One is in C++ and the other is in Python. It's OK if you're not totally following. We'll do lots of examples throughout the week, and hopefully that will kind of cement things for you. OK, so the last thing I want to say about Gem5's uh, architecture is that it's a discrete event simulator. So um, what this means is um, all the timing in Gem5 is specified by latencies for events. So Gem5 has an event queue that has some events in it. And so this is five different events, um, one that's going to happen at time 10, one at 11, a different event that's happening at time 20 and time 50, and then the first event is also going to happen at uh, time 50. So we have this uh, event queue, which is a priority queue, uh, sorted by the event times. And at each time step, or at each iteration of the um, event loop, Gem5 is going to look at the head, um, move time to the time of that head event, um, then dequeue it, and execute that event. That event will likely schedule other events as well, which will go wherever in the event queue uh, they need to go. So events can only schedule other events in the future. And then after this event is done executing, again, 
we look at the event queue, and now we increase time to 11 because the next event is happening at time 11. Yeah? Yes, I will give an example of events here in a second. Yeah, good question. Um, so yeah, the last thing I want to say here is just that uh, sim objects, um, kind of the definition of a sim object is a sim object can have the queue events onto this global um, event queue. Um, so here's an example of what uh, a discrete event simulation looks like for a computer system. Sorry, it's a little small. So for instance, you might have an event um, which you in queue at time zero to fetch the first instruction. So that event will execute a function maybe to send a request to the cache. So that event does some stuff, and what it's going to do is send a request to the cache. And then that, sending a request to the cache, is going to enqueue an event, an event in the future, maybe the Owen tag latency in the future. So then, after Owen tag latency passes, we are going to execute that event. And maybe that event is a miss in the L1, in which case that's going to enqueue a new event to send uh, a request to DRAM. So that might enqueue an event to put it in the read queue, which might enqueue an event in the future to get the data from the DRAM, which might enqueue an event in the future to process the data in the cache. And then that cache is going to send it back to the processor, which is going to decode the instruction and execute the instruction. And then after all that, we'll enqueue an event to fetch the next instruction, which is going to go through this again. So these are the kinds of events um, that we use. So, so the uh, resolution here, so time in an event-driven simulator needs a unit. In Gem 5, we call this time ticks. We need a way, so we need to specify some, we care about the real performance. I'm trying to be careful with my language here. We care about the performance of the system. So we want some kind of conversion from this tick to seconds. This is actually a parameter in Gem 5. You can make the tick rate whatever you want it to be. It's usually one picosecond. So if your clock rate is at one gigahertz, so you would enqueue something for the next cycle one nanosecond in the future, that would be 1,000 ticks in the future. So to do all these, um, so Gem 5's main abstractions, I want to talk a little bit, bit, bit about that. So there's kind of two main abstractions in Gem 5. One is on the memory side. So we have memory requests in Gem 5, which flow across ports. These ports allow you to send and receive memory requests. Um, although I have drawn them as bidirectional, uh, ports are unidirectional. Um, so a CPU has a requester port, and the L1 cache has a responder port. The crossbars have CPU side ports and memory side ports. And the CPU side are responder ports, and the memory side are requester ports. Basically, anything with a request port can be connected to something with a response port. And so you can kind of arbitrarily connect things together with this port um, interface. And we'll cover a lot more of this uh, later. So on the other side, the other main abstraction that we have is the CPU model and the ISA. So Gen 5 abstracts away the ISA and the CPU model, so you can use any model, the in-order model, the out-of-order model, the simple model, with any ISA, ARM, x86, RISC-V, Spark, Power, whatever you want. Actually, maybe we don't do Spark anymore. Um, so there's an interface here between the ISA and the CPU. So the CPU sends some bytes to decode to the ISA. The ISA figures out what that instruction is and gives the CPU back a static instruction. And then the CPU uses that instruction, um, an interface with that instruction, to talk to the ISA to actually get it to execute. So we have these two main um, abstractions in Gym 5 that allow us to be really modular and plug things um, in and out. And we'll get a lot more, uh, go into a lot more detail on this in the model and cores and actually talk about how to add a new instruction to an ISA. Okay, that's it for this section. So we talked about um, a little bit about the history of Gym 5. We talked a little bit about um, what my views on simulation why we use simulation are, um, and then a little bit about Gem 5 software architecture.